Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Welcome back, wildlings. Tonight's story, The Asylum, by Raxus. My friends and I used to do a lot of geocaching after our senior year in high school. For those who don't know what geocaching is, it's essentially a worldwide scavenger hunt. People will select sites and conceal a cache somewhere unobtrusive, and then post GPS coordinates on geocaching websites where other searchers can download the cords and locate the cache. Usually people who have found the object, often it's a chest, box, or something hollow, will leave a note or a small personal memento for future searchers to find and appreciate. There are several different types of geocaches. Most of them are thematic in nature. Scenic destinations, romantic sites, hard to reach areas, etc. This story begins when my friends and I decided to try a series of purportedly haunted locales about an hour's drive from our hometown. It began, innocently enough, most of the sites had spooky backstories that were, of course, entirely fabricated. So we had a great time scaring the piss out of each other and generally creeping ourselves out. We'd begun searching after the sun had set to enhance the creep factor, but by around midnight, most of our large group had dwindled off and gone their separate ways. When we reached the last cord, there was just myself, Rebecca, Kevin, and Evan left, and we were determined to knock this off our list. Rebecca was our guide for the night, in charge of putting the coordinates in and reading us the backstory for each site, so while I drove, she began reading about the last one out loud to the rest of us. Now, admittedly I'm paraphrasing here, but it was something along the lines of Henkel Asylum. Constructed in the early 1900s, the James Henkel Asylum was built to house a burgeoning population of the criminally insane, men who had committed vile crimes, rape, murder, torture, without any sign of remorse were deemed mentally unstable and sent to this facility for further study and perhaps rehabilitation. Once committed, however, very few criminals were ever released back into society, and those who were usually had been given frontal lobotomies, a popular experimental procedure at the time, or electroshock therapy, and both of these rendered the patient nearly brain dead, capable of performing only rudimentary tasks. Stories. Contemporary visitors to the asylum report hearing banging noises, cell doors opening and closing, and hearing cackling laughter that is abruptly cut short. This was pretty standard fare, and we'd gotten used to it because of the rest of the sites that we'd visited that night. So we naturally had a good time psyching each other out for the next 15 minutes while I drove us to the asylum. We'd all heard about it, it was in our local area after all, and we knew that it had been condemned and abandoned since as long as any of us could remember, so we figured that it would be a great place to run around and be reckless teenagers without risk of getting yelled at by the cops. When we finally arrived, it kinda looked like something straight out of one of those cheesy B-movies they show on sci-fi chain link fence with barbed wire around the perimeter, two guard towers flanking the main gate which was of course chained and locked shut with a big no trespassing sign hanging from it. The asylum itself was decrepit, looking like it hadn't been touched for decades, which was surprising, since we grew up in a pretty nice area where the municipal lawmakers tried to keep everything looking spiffy for the tourists. Now needless to say, we promptly ignored the sign on the front gate and hauled ourselves over the fence, cameras and GPS in hand, and walked toward the asylum. Given our attitudes toward the previous sites, you'd probably gathered that uh, I'm somewhat of a skeptic. I do believe that there are paranormal things that can't be explained yet, but I'm not exactly summoning demons in front of a bathroom mirror. So when we opened the main door to the asylum, conveniently unlocked, 
I dismissed the cold burst of wind as just stale, pent-up air rushing out after being trapped inside for so long. My friend's bravado, however, quickly disappeared, and they began shuffling their feet nervously at the entrance, hesitant to cross that invisible threshold. I took it upon myself to take point, shivying them along with prodding taunts, and eventually, everyone got inside. It wasn't as bad as I thought it'd be. Things were relatively clean, and the entire building looked like it had been gutted. The paint was peeling, tiles popping up here and there, and the metal trim near the baseboards of the wall was in desperate need of some rust be gone. But aside from that, the place was entirely empty. No crazy-ass chairs with leather straps, no gurneys lying haphazardly around, just an old reception desk and two hallways leading off to the different wings. We explored for a few minutes, freaking ourselves out whenever we heard an old pipe rattle or a rat squeak, but otherwise it was relatively uneventful. Our fears safely suppressed by the presence of each other, we began to get more adventurous, opening the doors and peeking inside. The rooms were all empty, of course. Whatever company had been contracted to clear the place out did a pretty decent job of removing any creepy decor. Bravado returning by the minute, Evan and Kevin dropped back without Rebecca or me noticing. Then they began running around, making noises to try and scare us. I'm not going to lie, it worked until I realized they were gone and probably the cause of all the racket. Then they returned laughing and breathless to a decidedly paler Rebecca. She seemed to be a lot more put off by the place than the rest of us were, or at least she didn't hide it as well. She quietly suggested that we leave. Now, not to be outdone by the other guys of the group, I told her that she was more than welcome to wait in the car if she wanted, but that I was going to stick around for a few more minutes. Exasperated, but defeated, she finally caved in and followed us where the GPS was leading, the second floor. This is where I started to feel genuinely scared. Before, I had been just kind of creeped out, but there was something about that whole floor that literally gave me the shivers despite it being a warm summer night. We started opening doors like before, but we were all a lot more sober about it. I guess I wasn't the only one who was feeling weird. Then finally, about midway through the hall, we opened the door to a room and there, lying in the middle of the floor, was an honest-to-God straitjacket. I'm not bullshitting you. Every other room was devoid of objects, but there it was. A fucking straitjacket in the middle of the floor of some random-ass room in a condemned mental asylum. We all kind of looked at each other with raised eyebrows as if to say, Hey, uh, guys, you seeing this? And of course, trying to show off for Rebecca, I, I piped up with the most ridiculous idea I could think of at the time. <laughs> Dude, I'm gonna put it on. Years of horror flicks and creepypastas should have trained me not to put on the creepy straitjacket in the creepy hall in the creepy asylum, but teenage dumbfuckery won over, and once the words were out, I couldn't just back out of it. Nobody said anything, they just kind of looked at me expectantly waiting to see if I'd follow through with my boast. Determined not to be called a coward for the remainder of the night, I walked forward into the room and bent down to pick up the moth-ridden restraining device. But as I got closer, I noticed that it wasn't moth-ridden at all, but was actually in pretty decent condition. That is, compared to the rest of the place, which, as I've said, was in shambles. I mean, it had a few stains here and there, but it didn't smell, and it seemed intact enough to put on. As soon as I picked it up, though, I got this overwhelming sense of dread. You know, that drop in the pit of your stomach right as you go over the lip of a roller coaster? That feeling in the bottom of your gut that says, I'm gonna die, I just know it? Yeah. Well, I got that. Really strong. And I totally ignored it. 
my desire not to die was outweighed as it often is in teenagers by my need to look cool for my friends, one of which was a girl I liked. So I slipped my hands into the sleeves one at a time until it hung loosely from my shoulders. Now, if you've ever seen an actual straight jacket, you know that you can't tie it up yourself. The whole point is to essentially cross your arms across your chest and tie the sleeves behind your back. It prevents whoever's inside the jacket from moving their arms, presumably to stop them from hurting themselves or others. So as I stood there in the middle of the room, I called out to Rebecca, Hey, Becca, could you tie this thing off for me? She looked, if you'll excuse the pun, pale as a ghost, but she managed to squeak out, I don't, I don't think this is a good idea. But again, after some prodding and encouraging, I convinced her to begin tying the sleeves behind my back. Evan and Kevin just stood in the doorway, expressions a mix of grudging admiration and incredulity. At that point in time, I felt like a badass. That lasted about three seconds. As soon as Rebecca finished up the last lace, the door to the cell slammed shut right in Kevin and Evan's faces. I never felt a breeze, and when I asked them both later, they fervently denied closing it themselves. Skeptic that I am, I still chalk it up to us leaving the front door open and changing air pressures and all of that, but in the moment, it scared the piss out of us nonetheless. Then I felt a pressure on my chest, like someone was sitting on it, or as if someone was pulling the sleeves tighter from behind me, and it began to get much harder to breathe. I couldn't even summon enough air to whisper, much less call out for help. My vision narrowed to tiny specks, and I swear I heard someone laughing shrilly as I neared unconsciousness. The pressure increased with a sudden tug, and my world went black. When I woke up, my vision was foggy, or at least I thought it was, until I realized that it wasn't just foggy. It was dark, like staring through a lens that's been collecting soot. I blinked a few times, and the darkness wavered, but it didn't dissipate. Now, I've passed out and blacked out before, but whenever I woke up, it was nothing like that. Either my vision gradually cleared up or remained blurry, but never in my life have I been able to recreate that shadowy haze I saw in the asylum that night. Then, from the murky depths, two small pinpoints of light appeared a few inches in front of my face, glaring a lurid red, and a dim echo of that laughter I'd heard before surrounded me. Then as soon as they appeared, they were replaced by two brilliant shafts of incandescence, Evan and Kevin shining flashlights down on my face. The last thing that I remember hearing before I lost consciousness again was Rebecca's scream and the front door banging open, which probably explains why the two were standing over me with flashlights in hand. I gradually became aware of a dull murmur that I recognized as Rebecca telling me, please wake up, please, please, please wake up, as she shook me. She just kept saying it over and over again, kept sobbing and shaking me. When I became aware enough that my vision cleared enough, I glanced over and saw that her eyes were completely red like she'd been crying for a while. Trying to muster some shred of self-control, I found myself speaking in a surprisingly calm voice, given how I was actually feeling. I remember distinctly what I said, word for word. Get those fucking flashlights out of my face, you douchebags. Expecting a laugh, or at least some reciprocal insults, I was kind of shocked when they just looked at each other, quizzically, seeming surprised. You, uh, you're you okay? Evan asked. Yeah, why the hell wouldn't I be? She just tied things too tight. I, I couldn't breathe, so I passed out. How long was I out for, anyway? I inquired. 
Apparently, it had been long enough for them to untie the straitjacket, which allowed me to rub a hand across my face. There was another shared look of disbelief. Dude, Kevin began slowly, you've been out for like 15 minutes. We were about to call 911. We kept shaking you. I even tried pinching you so hard I drew blood, but you wouldn't wake up. I felt a cold chill run down my spine, and the straitjacket hanging limply from my shoulders suddenly began to feel a bit tighter. Hastening to pull it off, I tried not to look panicked as I threw it into the corner of the room. Rebecca just sat there, still shaking and crying a little bit, and in spite of the ordeal that I'd just gone through, I had enough sense to go over and try and comfort her. We left the room without a word, Gia Cash be damned, and we walked back to the car in complete silence, broken only by the occasional sniffle. The sun started coming up, and as I dropped everyone off at their respective homes, we said quiet goodbyes. Rebecca's place was the last stop before I finally made the trip home myself, and at least trying to be a gentleman. I walked her to her front door, but she paused at the entry and looked at me right in the eye. In the light of the gray dawn, I could see that her eyes were still reddened from all the crying. She was very quiet as she said, I have to ask you something. Yeah, sure. What is it? I said, half expecting another, are you sure you're all right, like I'd been getting the whole ride home. But she surprised me by asking, Do you know how long it took Evan and Kevin to get that door open? Her eyes held a look that I could never forget. That was raw fear. Something had happened in that fraction of time between me blacking out and them getting in there that had absolutely terrified her. And seeing that look, I realized... I was blacked out for 15 minutes. How long had she been in that room alone? No, I replied slowly. How long? Five minutes. They said it took five minutes for them to open that stupid door. I was in there and I saw you and I saw she broke off. Another sob stopping her mid-sentence. At that point, I didn't want to know. I still don't. I grabbed her by the shoulders and said as firmly as I could, Rebecca, it doesn't matter. No matter what you saw, I'm here, you're here, we're both safe now. It doesn't matter. Nothing bad will happen. I promise. She just nodded numbly, opened her door, and walked inside her house. The next time I saw her, she was back to her usual self. But whenever I bring up that night to her, she freezes up and turns to stone and refuses to discuss it. I stand by what I said before. I don't want to know what happened in that room, and I don't ever want to know. But I still have nightmares about those two glowing red lights in the darkness. And sometimes, as I lapse into sleep, I hear faint echoes of shrill laughter following me down into the depths of unconsciousness. See, kids, sometimes spirits, entities, even just places, don't need to be overtly threatening to scare the hell out of you. Sometimes the knowledge that they're there, still waiting, is enough. Stay scary, wildlings, and make the most of your nights. <laughs>